Mr. Vice President, thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. I'd like to be with you. Enjoy being with you. The Iraq war, the end of the Iraq war in particular, has really been your brief as, as Vice President. The administration has has been open about the fact that the president really tasked this to you yes. um, in terms of winding this down. Your son served there. You've been involved as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee before being vice president. You were involved intimately in all of these decisions. Do you, do you, feel, uh, do you feel emotional about the end of the war? I tell you, I feel like, uh, I feel like I did something that uh, are participated in something being done that I can be proud of the rest of my life. I, um, had I stayed as chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, no matter how engaged I was, I don't think I would have been in a position to be able to affect events on a day-to-day -day basis to bring us to this point. I'm not saying our troops brought us to this point, our diplomats brought us to this point, but to be able to, I'll be blunt with you, after I made that speech in the palace, uh, to uh, with Maliki and with Talibani, uh, the president and prime minister, to Iraqi and American assembled troops. I left, got on the phone and called Barack. The president said, thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to do something that meant a great deal to me personally and to the country, to end this war in Iraq. That makes everything worthwhile in this job for me. Looking back nine years now uh, to the fall of, of 2002, and you voted for the authorization and use of yep. force to go to Iraq. Um, over the course of those nine years, how do you think the Iraq war changed us as a country? Is there, is there a lesson learned about how we debate the use of force, how we debate whether or not to go to war? I hope to God there is, because you know, when that original debate took place, what is easy to forget, I don't expect people to remember, uh, those of us like Dick Luger and myself and others who vote to authorize the president to, to uh, use force, were based on the president's commitment that not to use force, he had no intention of using force, and it was to demonstrate to the United Nations and to the world that we were united in wanting to stop Saddam Hussein. That's where we're united in. And we're united in him coming clean on what he had under his control. And it really, it re really spiraled out of control pretty quickly. And uh, so the fact is that I think one of the lessons we've learned is you can go into, and America is so powerful, has such an incredible military capability that you can go to, into any dictatorship and you can try to impose, as was stated, democracy, but it's going to take you a trillion dollars a decade and you're going to have to make a judgment whether or not you would better spend your time and effort doing something else to make the world safer than that. So I think it's, it's, it's really, I would give Libya as an example. It was clear that Muammar Gaddafi, who I personally knew, was really not a good guy at all. But what did the president do? The president, because of the confidence he had in the reestablished leadership of the world, the people looked to him as a leader, looked to America as a leader, what did he do? We spent several billion dollars, but we didn't lose one American life, we didn't put one boot on the ground, and we had a shared responsibility with the rest of the world, including Arab nations as well as NATO, to deal with that issue. And now there's a shared responsibility to the world to help them establish a democracy. That's very different than going alone. I hope we've learned the lesson that going alone, unless our immediate vital national interest is stake, going alone should be the very last option. When applying that sort of worldview and thinking about that logic and the, the, the conflict in Afghanistan that we are still involved in, I mean, right now the horizon on Afghanistan is that it, that war does not end for America this year, or next year, or the year after that, but at the end of the year after that, at the end of 2014 is the horizon that the president has described for the end of the Afghanistan war. Is it possible, I mean, that, that's also a war that you did not start, uh, started by the previous administration, but is it possible that that war could end sooner than the American people are already expecting at this point? Could that be wound down as well? It has the potential to be wound down. It's in direct proportion to how wound up the Afghan 
military is, how good they are, how quickly they come online, and how much responsibility the Afghan government in Kabul is able to exert politically in the, in, within Afghanistan. For example, the president said that we were going to withdraw, quote, the surge, 33,000 forces by the end of this summer. And he said we would continue to keep a pace that pace. We're not going to slow this down. This doesn't mean that we're going to wait till the last minute to say the other 60 some thousand folks are going to come out at the end of 20, you know, going into 2014. So we are the president's plan and he kept his commitment exactly as he stated it in Iraq and he'll keep it as it relates to Afghanistan is we are going to continue to draw down forces on a continuous basis continuing to turn over responsibility to the Afghans because at the end of the day we cannot want stability and peace in Afghanistan more than they want it and so our objective is to as responsibly as we can withdraw American forces in the numbers we have from Afghanistan. Iran uh, borders both Afghanistan and Iraq. Yep. Bottom line, after the Iraq war, is Iran in a stronger position than it would have been without the Iraq war? Because for all of Saddam Hussein's faults, he was Iran's sworn enemy. And now in the new Iraq, it's a, in some ways a de facto ally of Iran, or at least a more closely allied nation. Well. Um the argument was made early on that uh, we remove two of two of uh, Iran's uh, most greatest concerns: Saddam in Afghanistan and the Tal I mean in Iraq and the Taliban in Afghanistan. But the result now, with regard to Iran, in large part because of some very significant moves the president made and some really. Um, outrageous moves that Iran has made, it actually has lost power in the entire region. The fact of the matter is its only ally left in the region is about to be toppled, and that is in Syria with uh, uh, Bashar Assad. You also have a circumstance where since they flouted every international norm from refusing to protect diplomats to violating international agreements relating to nuclear arms and nuclear weapons, or the attempt to get nuclear weapons, to actually attempting to assassinate on foreign soil a diplomat in an Arab nation. They have been continually marginalized. But the biggest thing that's happened is the president has been able to unite the world, including Russia and China, in continuing to ostracize and to isolate Iran. So the truth is, and I really mean this, Rachel, the, the, the talk about the projection, the, the capacity of Iraq to project power in the Gulf is actually diminished. They are less feared, they are less, they have less influence than they have had any time, I would argue, in the last 20 years. And there will be a relationship between Iraq and Iran because they have a very long border. They will trade, they should have a normal relationship, but they are not allies. Remember, these are the guys that, in fact, uh, um, fought against Iran. Even the Shia in, in Iraq found great difficulty with Iran. You've seen a Shia leader now who's the prime minister sharing power with others of his, of his uh, uh, colleagues, uh, moving against the forces of uh, uh, the, the militias that are supplied by and have been in part supplied by Iran. So I would argue that I see no evidence no evidence that Iran's influence has produced a de facto alliance with Iraq, nor has their influence grown in the last three years under the president's policies in the region. Mr. Vice President, thank you so much for your time today. It's a real honor to have this time with no, you. Thank you, sir. Great to be with you. Thank you. Vice President Joe Biden speaking exclusively, exclusively excuse me, with me here in Washington, D.C. today. Uh, at the end there, talking about Iran, the vice president was implicitly countering some Republican criticism uh, that the Obama administration should somehow be tougher with Iran. Among this year's Republican presidential candidates, for example, uh, even long shot former Utah Governor John Huntsman, who sort of has the reputation as the cool, calm, collected guy in the Republican room. Uh, even John Huntsman says that he would like to start a war with Iran, a preemptive war. Former Vice President Dick Cheney even said on CNN last night that we should have dropped a bomb on Iran last week after one of our drones crashed there. 
Personally, I, I have to say it is striking to be in Washington in this context. Today, having this face-to-face -face conversation with the Democratic administration, this vice president, about his pride in ending the war, which you could see in the way he talked about it there, his pride and their satisfaction in finally extricating us from Iraq after eight and a half years there. And the, the, to then have the parallel Republican political conversation in the country be about how upsetting it is that the Iraq war is ending. Questioning how soon can we start another one next door in Iran? Ron Paul is the only Republican presidential candidate who dissents from that view, who doesn't say he wants to start another war and let's not end the Iraq one either. Ron Paul is the only one among all of the Republican candidates, which gives you a counterintuitive, politically incorrect angle on why, even though no one in the Beltway takes him seriously, the latest PPP poll out today says Ron Paul is only one point out of the lead right now in Iowa.